Welcome. This is number four in our 2011 series of interviews about the European Union. And I'm delighted to introduce a very special guest from Sydney, Dr. Oliver Hardwich. Oliver was kicked out, out of Great Britain just about five years ago by the then opposition leader David Cameron. David Cameron is now the Prime Minister, of course, at Great Britain. And we are delighted that we have a prominent thinker, intellectual, based at the Centre for Independent Studies, Centre for Independent Studies, that's right, in, in Sydney. Dr. Harwich, welcome. Hi, nice to have you. I want to ask you about Great Britain and the European Union. And in the first half, I thought we'll focus mostly on British attitudes. That's of great interest to our students. But I also know that you have done a lot of work about the Eurozone, so these would be the two main issues uh, that we want to focus on. Starting with Britain, Britain has always had an uneasy relationship to Europe. And initially, of course, Britain was not all that interested in joining the project of the European Economic Community. The British story is interesting because Britain, of course, lost an empire but didn't find a role for some time. Um, after they won the war with, of course, great American support, they thought they had to start a new project, but there was a time when the empire was crumbling, so it took them some time to realize where the new role for Britain would be. And it became quite clear to the British in the early 1960s that perhaps the future for Britain would be within some kind of European project that was just emerging really at the time. And it was in 1961 when they first applied for membership in this new European economic community. And of course, were rejected by de Gaulle and then rejected again in 1967 and then finally managed to get in in the early 70s. But in it was 1973, as all my students know, yes, that yes. was the year when Angie, a song by the Rolling Stones, was the most popular song in the United Kingdom, which is not relevant to any of this, sorry. It's 1973, that I is think important it, for it us. It probably wasn't causal, was it? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was. Sorry, 1973, uh, Britain entered the uh, European Economic Community then, but I still want to uh, mention one aspect of the British kind of wariness about that project, which sounds somewhat counterintuitive today, but initially Britain was worried about that project because it saw it as a capitalist plot, right? You described in a, in a book about England how uh, the experience of the war from a British perspective was the one in which the state proved very capable of defeating Nazi Germany, in fact. While in Germany, in contrast, the state failed the German people. It was the totalitarian state led by Hitler. So what we saw in Germany was a new beginning, a new departure, an endorsement of liberal ideals, while in Britain, those liberal mm. ideals that we associate with Britain today still were abandoned initially. I think that's correct. I think if you look at um, the year 1945, um, that's a year of departure really for Britain and Germany in terms of economic philosophy. As you said, in Germany, the state was completely discredited. I mean, 12 years of Nazi rule, the Holocaust, the, one of the worst wars in history, the state was discredited. No one was expecting anything from the state in Germany. And that's why it was relatively easy to convince the Germans actually that the state shouldn't control the economy. Ludwig Erhard as economics minister uh, pushed for his uh, version of the social market economy at the time and uh, turned Germany for at least about 20 years into a quite liberal economy. In Britain, on the other hand, you had the reverse experience. In Britain, what you had was that idea, okay, we've won the war, now we want to win the peace and we want to build something new out of the war and if we want to have an economy that is basically centrally planned because that's how we won the war, by central planning, with a lot of rationing and with all our national resources directed at this one goal. Now they wanted to build that, what they call the New Jerusalem. So they wanted to have an, a functioning economy, but basically it was a socialist project. And you can still see some of the um, ideas in practice today from this post-war period. Britain got a planning system that's still operating today. Britain got the National Health Service. Britain got its uh, modern welfare state, basically in this post-war period under Prime Minister Clem Attlee. And so the British were planning the economy and Britain was going more into this kind of um, planned socialist, half socialist economy. And that was the predominant mood and that lasted probably, I would say, until 1979 with the election of Thatcher. That all changed, of course. But really the comparative history of Germany and Britain in this period is quite different. Different economic philosophies at play and they work much better, I think, in Germany in a rather free market Germany in the post-war period than in Britain. Now, taking this to the project of European unification, that project itself was also driven by contradictory ideals uh, in terms of the common market. Of course, it was very much indebted to the Hayekan ideal of, of uh, interstate cooperation. 
uh, Hayek, in fact, wrote, a, wrote an essay about interstate federalism already in 1939. But then I don't in terms think Hayek of, had the European Union in mind no, when he wrote that. No, no. Uh, but in terms of a number of policies, including the common agricultural policy, there is much more state intervention. And to this day, I think there is a great deal of tension between these two different kind of logics in some ways. But you just mentioned that uh, Britain changed rather dramatically through the election of Margaret Thatcher. And arguably, the direction of the European project changed significantly with the leadership of Margaret Thatcher, so much so that John Gillingham, a British historian of European integration, describes Thatcher as uh, the mother of Europe, referring to her role in the Single European Act. How do you see the Single European Act in the context of European integration? Well, I think Margaret Thatcher would actually be quite amused to be um, seen herself as the mother of Europe because I don't think she sees herself like that. I think we have to go back a step. Um, the European Union, the European Economic Community, it wasn't just an economic project, of course, and I think that's one of the major difficulties for Britain within Europe because the original members of the European Economic Community, the founding members, they were, from the very first moment that it was founded in 57, in favor of ever closer union. They wanted to drive this European project and it was always meant to be a political project as well. When Britain joined in 73, it wasn't actually sold as that kind of political project to the British. To the British, it was sold as basically an enlargement of the British market. They could export to Europe, they could become part of that European trade zone. And that was the basic attraction really for the British because they had just lost their empire, they had lost some of their original trading partners, they wanted to substitute that, they wanted to be part of that European Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle that was happening on the continent. The British wanted to be part of that zone, but they didn't quite want to be part of the political process to the same degree. And I think that's where the tension comes from because it was sold to them really as a free trade project and it turned out and developed into this political project that we have today. Britain, I think, in 73 would have never envisaged becoming part of a European Union that was a political entity. They really just wanted to trade. Well, but of course the EU literature is full of about the kind of logic of spillover, yeah, that it may well have started uh, through economic cooperation, but it was anticipated by the leaders, uh, in fact by the architects of European unity, that it would uh, spill over into areas of politics. And of course one of the main areas in which that logic can be exemplified is the project of the common European currency because currency on the one hand is really just a technical economic instrument. In fact, I have a question here from our students at Macquarie University in Sydney who asked in, in light of the, in the global financial crisis, what do you believe is the possibility that the United Kingdom would join the Eurozone in the near future and what might the implications be of it if it were to join? I think uh, the chances are zero that uh, Britain will join because um, first of all um, they have a very Eurosceptic Prime Minister now, David Cameron. Um, David Cameron had always um, said that he would uh, put a referendum before any step to uh, deepen European integration. So I don't see that happening and frankly he would have to be quite quick because the Euro may not even survive until that day. <laughs> well, uh, you are rather sceptical about the whole project of the common uh, European currency and that is uh, something that we should develop further. Now, when we talk about the experience of that major crisis, uh, which is another statement in relation to the Second World War, one of the arguments you developed in relation to Britain, but I suspect it applies to most Western nations, is that through those major crises, the state sector expanded steadily. And so today in, in Western Europe, even Britain has a very uh, large uh, kind of state-controlled uh, sector of the economy, as has Germany, etc. Now, in relation to the current crisis, this is kind of intriguing, isn't it? Because on the one hand, the crisis has been triggered, say, by the developments in the US, but in Europe, it's mostly about the high levels of sovereign debt, unsustainable levels of sovereign debt in all major countries, including Germany and France. So mm. that means that the state sector will have to be reduced as a result of it. On the other hand, of course, more and more people are calling for more state intervention. And in fact, more and more people are calling for more EU intervention, if you want. So will the crisis be utilized to give the European Union more powers? Well, I think the um, theory that you refer to is this crisis and Leviathan theory that uh, was developed, I think, by Robert Hicks initially, where he said 
that with the state um, it always takes crises and the state will actually use that crisis to enlarge its role. And it's true if you go into history and you have a look at what happened to government spending, for example, after the First World War, well actually within the First World War first of all, then afterwards and after the Second World War. These are the major crises that drive government activity and you can see it in the case of Britain. Britain before the First World War had a government that spent about 10% of GDP and after the, second, uh, after the First World War it went up to 20 then reached 25% in the interwar period and then after the Second World War for some period it was around 40-45%. And you can see it going up again now in the um, European crisis, in the uh, sovereign debt crisis, in the GFC. So these crises actually, um, they trigger government activity. Now, whether this theory still holds in today's circumstances is a different matter because we may, have, we may have reached a point where the government simply can't take any additional roles because they simply can't afford it any longer. I mean, there is a point where this logically will stop. You can't have a government spending more than 100% of GDP. You probably can't have a government spending more than 50% of GDP for too long a time because in the end there's no one there to actually produce money and produce goods to pay for all of this. I think we have reached this point in Europe because just look at Britain. Britain is currently spending about 52% of its GDP, the state spending. Well, the, the Soviet Union managed to do it for 70 years and my own homeland, Czechoslovakia, also managed to do it for Of course, with years. extremely um, beneficial results as we all know. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, talk about recent um, examples, talk about China for example, as far as I know China um, state spending um, is about 30% of GDP. So actually it turns out that China is now a more free market economy than Britain or something can't be right here. Well that's an amazing counter example actually because China surely at least nominally is still communism and an authoritarian regime too. So and you are not advocating that what Chinese are doing they should be emulated by, by the <laughs> I'm not advocating that at all, not Western for a minute, Europe. no. <laughs> Let's discuss in a bit more detail the, the Eurozone crisis. I know that you have written about it extensively. And one of the issues that worries me is what its impact is going to be on different perceptions in the member states. Uh, you are originally from Germany, so you have followed the German responses uh, very closely. But we are also watching what's going on in, in Greece, Ireland, in fact in, in Portugal now. We met last year when Greece was just bail out, bailed out and you were skeptical about the Eurozone as a whole already then. How do you see the current crisis unfolding now? Well, I was skeptical last year and I wouldn't say that I'm more optimistic this year. I think uh, what we have seen was really a car crash in slow motion because Remember when Greece happened, everybody said, well, okay, we have to stop this happening because otherwise it will spread to other countries. Well, we saw it happening in Greece and it spread to Ireland. And then it happened in Ireland and everybody said, okay, now we have to help the Irish because otherwise it might spread to Portugal. So we helped the Irish and it has spread to Portugal. And I think we're doing exactly the same again because now everybody's saying, well, okay, at least we stopped Portugal so it won't spread to Spain. And I think if we meet again next year, we'll probably talk about a Spanish bailout. So I think this is continuously developing. I'm not a great fan of the European Union. I'm a great um, believer in uh, European identity. I, I think there is some value to the European ideal. Um, but I think European Monetary Union was taken it a step too far because you had the um, economies bound in, in this monetary union that were simply too diverse. You had economic heavyweights like, like France and Germany. Um, you had some periphery countries like Greece and Portugal. You had the Irish Celtic Tiger economy that was structurally very different from the rest. And to bind all of these countries together under one monetary policy, I think that was always a recipe for disaster and that's what the Europeans just got. Now, the proponents of the project would say that this is a tremendous opportunity to actually push the project further towards deeper integration. And in fact, even uh, my, my colleague Jan, Jan Liebig, uh, 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 an economist who also studied the area uh, extensively, pointed out that it's, it's about fiscal policies and that if this crisis necessitates or forces countries like Greece, Portugal or in fact Spain to adjust uh, their reckless policies in the past, that it might be beneficial even to those countries. Uh, medium Theoretically, water. yes, it might be beneficial if um, Greece actually learns the lesson and spends less and gets its uh, public finances in order. But how likely is this and how long is it going to take? I think the point that you make um, that some interested parties will actually use this to um, further their own agendas, 
That's probably correct. And we see this. We see that France, for example, always wanted to have a closer integration of economic policy in Europe. That's exactly what they're getting well, in they the crisis. Well, they talk about economic government or governance. There is even a dispute between Germany and France, I suppose, when you call it economic government, you imply more control than when you just talk about governance. Whatever you call it, though, there is probably some logic to the idea that if you have a common currency, you need to coordinate also economic policies in individual member states. Would you not say that? Uh, I probably agree with that, but I think uh, we are really putting the cart before the horse here because that should have happened earlier. You can't just start with monetary union and say and, and afterwards we are creating all the conditions that are necessary for it to work. I think you should do it the other way around. You should first create all the conditions and make sure that um, the, the countries within the monetary union uh, um, system are sufficiently um, coherent. But I think we were doing it the other way around. And, um, in all honesty, um, no one would claim that Greece was ready for monetary union. And Greece had fiddled with the figures, as we all know, and that was all extremely well known at the time when it happened. Really, um, to come 10 years later and say, well, actually, now we should really create the conditions necessary for monetary union, that doesn't work. There is a theory in economics of an optimal currency um, area, and um, that was never present in, in Europe. Now, other countries uh, have different kind of uh, scenarios and, and Ireland, of course, which was the second uh, country that needed the bailout, didn't behave in such a reckless manner uh, as a country. Yeah? And that was again something that Jan Liebig pointed out, that uh, they had true. surpluses. surpluses. Uh, it was just the banks that Spain as well, by the way. Spain also yeah, yes. had surpluses. But Again, look would, at would you also still maintain that the crisis in Ireland has been uh, exacerbated, if not caused? No, ab absolutely. I, I think uh, you lived in Ireland as well. I visited Ireland for a project I was doing with um, Policy Exchange in London in 2005. I had a look at the Irish property market, and you can read it in my report. Then I said this market shows every sign of a bubble because the Irish uh, property market was uh, boosted by too low interest rates. The interest rates at the time were too low for Ireland and they were kept low because that's what France and Germany at the time needed. The European economies were never in sync. Um, I mean, theoretically, uh, they should all move together, but they didn't, of course. And so Ireland always got interest rates that were far too low for its booming economy. That's why the Irish property market exaggerated. That's why you got this big bubble in the Irish property market. That's why you also got a bubble in Spanish property. Now we're seeing the reverse of uh, these uh, conditions. Now that interest rates are relatively low um, for these periphery countries that are struggling with that, Portugal, Greece, Ireland, at the same time the interest rates are too low for Germany, which is booming. Uh, if Germany still has its own national currency, interest rates would probably be around 3.5% and not like the 1.25% that we currently have. And, so and that is actually after the recent decrease by 0.25% that just took place a, indeed, a week ago. Indeed. Um, so I think once again you can see that uh, European economies are not in sync and we are having a one-size-fits-none monetary policy. You can't work like that. In the long run you have to solve, resolve these issues. I don't think we, we can ever resolve them with this kind of economic government that European heads of government are not talking about. Now, how do you assess the political implications of all this? This is something that interests me more. I don't have enough background in economics, but I just don't see how people in Greece, in Ireland, and in fact in Portugal, and if not in Spain tomorrow, are going to accept those austerity measures. I mean, austerity measures are never easy to accept. Uh, yeah? And even, even structural reforms that took place in Australia, say, in the 80s or in the 90s were not popular, but they had strong political support, they had support of the unions, etc., and uh, they were not there as an issue available for populist, popular nationalist mobilization, which is something that I would fear in places like Greece, Ireland and Portugal. These are proud nations with great histories and they now see, the way they perceive it is that they have to accept the dictate, you know, articulated in Brussels, in Frankfurt, in, in Berlin and, and Paris. That's precisely the problem, that they see these policies of austerity as a kind of a dictate from Berlin or from Frankfurt or from Brussels when actually they should understand that uh, there is an economic necessity, that they would have to cut back their spending, that they would get they have to get their house in order in any case. Um, the problem is really that uh, these austerity measures are of course extremely unpopular and uh, the countries in question are resisting. We had some violent riots in Greece. Um, we had um, a 
an Irish government that was kicked out in the process. We have now um, seen that in Portugal the government disintegrated and um, um, people are resisting. People don't want to be told what to do when actually they should be doing it anyway, but they don't like to take orders from Berlin or Frankfurt. Well, both Ireland and Portugal are kind of amazing in terms of democratic accountability, aren't they? Because the Irish had to accept the package and then they had elections and the new government is quite desperate to renegotiate the agreement but seems powerless to do so, while the Portuguese case is even more extreme, whereby Portugal right now is governed by a caretaker government that lost support of its parliament, yet Portugal will be forced to accept conditions. So the country is not governed from within, yes? Um, and it's, it's very difficult to get these measures through anyway because they're extremely unpopular and it's not even clear whether they will help in the long run. I could understand, um, uh, as, a, as a Portuguese or Greek citizen, I could probably understand um, that I have to uh, take some cuts and that will have to live with austerity if I knew that in the end we would all be better off. But you can't even promise them that because they know that in the end it is still likely that they, the country will default because what we are doing at the moment, we're not actually bailing them out, we're just giving them extra credit. So uh, at the end of all the Greek rescue packages, for example, Greece will be left with about 150, 160% debt to GDP. So that means they will still be bankrupt. So what you're doing is you're not actually solving their problems. You're creating economic havoc in these countries with the austerity measures, but you're not really solving the underlying problems. And it's no wonder then that people are rightly hesitant to accept this as their preferred solution. And so it's not even clear like what the elections will be all about in Portugal, say in, in June this year, as they are planned for for June, presumably by then, some kind of rescue package would have been agreed already and imposed on Portugal, I suspect. That's probably true. So in the end, um, the Portuguese and the Irish government will be relatively powerless vis-a-vis -vis the demands from Brussels or from Frankfurt or Berlin. Now, another counterexample that is very interesting to consider because it has many similarities to the problems, say, of Ireland yet a country was outside the Eurozone, in fact, outside of the European Union. In fact, there was a joke for a while before Ireland experienced difficulties. The question was, what's the difference between Ireland and Iceland? Three months. Three months <laughs> <Yeah>. and one letter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one letter and three months. Iceland has experienced very severe, um, well, s very serious difficulties with its uh, banks, uh, but staying outside of the Eurozone, would you say that that made it worse for Iceland, as we were told by EU leaders, or was it perhaps uh, I think um, that's what uh, Iceland initially feared, that it would be um, helpless outside the Eurozone, that there would be no support for them. And it was helpless, though. At some stage, Russia was going it to bail out Iceland. I wasn't all that It looked very dire for that, Iceland, but okay. I've just written um, an article for the Business Spectator, which you can read on the Business Spectator website tomorrow. Yeah, that's an advertisement. Yes. Um, and, um, Brilliant series of articles there, actually. Um, the um, Icelandic example is really interesting because, in the end, it wasn't as bad as everybody feared in 2008. Uh, remember what happened to Iceland. Iceland was a country with three big banks and the banks were far too big for the country. The country couldn't support them. They were the ban banks uh, Glitnir, Kaupthing and Landsbanki. And Iceland had become some kind of hedge fund with an island attached to it. And when these banks went under in the GFC, um, that created a massive problem for Iceland, um, a massive devaluation of the Icelandic currency, the krona. Um, also some problems, of course, for Dutch and British savers who had invested in these banks, and we can talk about that later. But um, everybody was afraid that this would be a massive disaster for Iceland, that they would never be able to recover from that. And uh, they were fearing high double-digit unemployment rates, um, uh, really an economic disaster on, unknown, on an unknown scale, really. But if you look at Iceland today, actually, it's not that bad. Um, they got inflation under control. It peaked at 18% in the economic crisis, but it's down to 2.3% now. So that's basically on target of the Icelandic Central Bank. Unemployment around 7%, <coughs> tourism up. Uh, unsurprisingly, Iceland used to be an extremely expensive tourist destination, but if you've got massive devaluation, of course, it will become more affordable for tourists to visit Iceland, and I can tell you how expensive it was. I still remember my $40 small pizza I had in Reykjavik once, and it wasn't even a good pizza. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, e extremely expensive. Uh, don't even think of drinking a beer in Reykjavik. Uh, it, it, that was completely unaffordable. I've never slept in a hotel room that was as small and expensive as in Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. 
But that of course all changed because the Icelandic krona devalued and suddenly Iceland became a much more attractive country for tourists and actually Iceland managed to turn its economy around. You now have for the first time in eight years a trade surplus. Suddenly Iceland can export more because of the um, adjustments in its exchange rate and that's exactly what devaluation should do to an economy. Um, just to give perhaps one tiny example of what happened in the Icelandic economy. Um, at the peak of the uh, crisis, McDonald's announced to shut down its one branch in Reykjavik. Now, I mean, culturally, of course, it's a big loss to Iceland, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> it's exactly what should happen when a country experiences these kinds of difficulties, because um, McDonald's Iceland had to import m most of its products from abroad. So they were suddenly too expensive, and so it was no longer really worth importing that stuff just to produce some burgers and Big Macs in, in Reykjavik. And so what happened was that um, local, local businesses actually took over from these imports. So they substituted the imports with local produce, which, which is exactly what should happen in a devaluation. And that actually helped the, Irish eco uh, the Icelandic economy to recover. Now compare that experience with Ireland, and you can see why that didn't happen. Or compare it with Greece. In Greece and in Ireland, the uh, currency couldn't devalue because they were locked in. They were locked into the euro. And Dublin still remains one of the most expensive capitals in, in Europe. And actually Athens as a tourist destination is still relatively expensive because you could probably take your tourist dollar much further in Turkey or in Croatia mm -hmm. rather than in Athens. So that option wasn't open to Greece, to Ireland, but it was an option for Iceland. And Iceland made brilliant use of it because the Icelandic krona lost almost 50% uh, uh, of its value. And so suddenly Iceland managed to turn its economy around. And that worked. It was painful, of course, but it worked. Now, Iceland, of course, is, is the candidate for the membership in the European Union. Uh, probably not anymore. OK. Um, <laughs> you saw what happened. Um, Iceland became, um, well, they became quite panicky, really, about the whole thing. Being left alone in the North Atlantic with 320,000 people on this cold island. Um, and they thought, if you're ever going to recover, we need friends, we need help, we need outside help. And they, yeah, they even looked up to Russia, you know, so for someone coming from Czechoslovakia, that, that was a scary moment. That's a sign that of desperation. Was seriously <laughs> contemplated that <laughs> Russia would bail out Iceland. Uh, Maybe I should have asked China as well. <laughs> but, <laughs> What actually happened in Iceland was that at that stage they decided that maybe they should become a part of the European Union after all, because then they would have big friends, powerful friends, friends that can bail out countries like Portugal or Greece. So there is enough money, of course, for Iceland. Um, so they seriously started ne negotiations about European Union membership, and um, they were willing to even uh, compromise on their fishing grounds. They were willing to introduce European laws. They were willing to go down the whole route, but there was one problem. The problem was the Icelandic banks. They were still um, um, causing massive problems to Icelandic politicians because what happened when um, the Icelandic banks went under was um, that uh, there were Dutch and British savers who had invested in a bank called IceSafe. I remember that quite well because they were offering these um, extremely good um, banking deals at the time when I lived and in Britain. a good label, yeah, IceSafe. Ice safe. Oh, yeah. So you probably put your money into the eternal ice and wait. Yes. Um, they were offering interest rates that were two, three percentage points higher than what you could get at a standard high street UK bank. So it was quite attractive, but I had visited Iceland before and I thought at the time, well, what do they produce apart from fish? So I, I kept my money with Lloyd's TSB, mm. which had to be nationalized anyway, but let's not go there. <laughs> we won't go into your money situation. So, <laughs> but there were British and Dutch savers who had trusted that um, these Icelandic banks were offering great deals and they could always repay and they were solvent and properly regulated banks and of course, that doesn't work because as everybody knows, when you get high interest rates, there is usually a high risk involved. And the risk was actually that these banks went under in the GFC. But then these Dutch and uh, British savers asked for compensation and they managed to get their local governments, their national governments, um, to um, compensate them. I mean, there was no um, legal obligation. Um, the British and the Dutch government didn't have to compensate people who were foolish enough to carry their money to Iceland, but they did it anyway, out of sheer populism, I would say. And then the Dutch and the British government turned around and said, okay, you Icelandic government, you now pay for that. And of course, there was no legal obligation for the Icelandic government either, because um, why should they then pay for foolish Dutch or British savers? But anyway, because they needed help, they were seriously negotiating with European countries and with Britain and the Netherlands and agreed initially to repay that money that was paid out to Dutch and British savers, which I thought was outrageous. 
But um, then the Icelandic president said, well, actually, hang on, not so fast, because that's a lot of money for us. Um, we were talking about, what, $16,000 per person in Iceland that Icelanders would have to pay for these uh, foolish Dutch and British savers. And so it went to a referendum, and 93% of Icelanders said no to that. But that was in the last... That uh, was in January 2010. And then the Icelanders, in their whole experience of dealing with the European Union, learned what the European Union really meant by democracy. And democracy in the European Union means, yes, we give it a referendum, but if you don't say what we want, then we'll have another referendum afterwards and you can get it right then. And so that's what happened just last weekend. But the question wasn't exactly the no, same. No, the question was, was really, <laughs> would you be willing to repay the Dutch and the British government for compensating people who had their money in ICE-SAFE? And would you be willing to commit until the year 2046 to the tune of $16,000 per person, per woman, per man, per child in Iceland? And once again, 58% of the Icelanders said no. But they knew fully well, of course, that once they say no, their chances of ever being admitted into the great European Union are relatively diminished because the Dutch and the British government would block any Icelandic accession. That's right. Every one of the member states can, can veto the Yes. Margin. So I think effectively what that um, referendum now tells us is that the Icelanders have given up on it. Um, mm -hmm. They probably don't see the European Union as that beneficial project and benevolent project anymore because they have seen in the negotiations that it can actually be quite brutal and quite nasty if uh, they demand that you first open all your fishing grounds, that you then compensate some foolish savers, that you have to play by all European rules. And as a great price for all of your efforts, you are then bound in a monetary union with Portugal and Greece. So they said no, and I think correctly so. Now let's go back to Europe then. And the, the, the way you presented Iceland would suggest that the best thing for European uh, politicians to do is to accept that the Eurozone failed and to somehow embark on its dismantlement. But that is a very uh, tricky process. Is it at all feasible? I, I'm reminded of Hungarian economists who said uh, when communism collapsed that it was one thing to turn a free market economy into a command-style communist economy, but another thing altogether to undo that process. And the image that they used was the one of, uh, you know, and you have an aquarium and, and turn that fish into a fish soup that's uh, quite doable, but to turn a mm. fish soup into an aquarium uh, might be quite difficult, if not impossible. What would your scenario be? What would uh, they need to do to undo that damage, if we accept your, your analysis of the situation so far? And, and I, I'm thinking about the book that was uh, published last year by uh, Hans Olaf Henkel, uh, distinguished businessman in Germany, a, a prominent public figure, mm -hmm. someone who supported the Eurozone initially. In fact, he traveled around Germany and tried to convince his uh, lands people that that was uh, desirable for Germany. You were already then skeptical, as I know. Hans Olaf Henkel uh, uh, suggests that the Eurozone failed, but it can be partially rescued by creating two Eurozones, as it were, one for prudent countries, you know, thrifty countries uh, like Germany, um, Austria, Finland, Finland, even Sweden, he said, would join once that is created because Sweden, of course, is outside the Eurozone. And then the other Eurozone for all those lazy bastards who always have budget deficit, etc. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say lazy bastards, but the sentiment is there. <laughs> and, and, and the surprising uh, uh, aspect of that suggestion to me was he talks about the southern Europe, and of course, when you talk in Germany about the southerners, the implied message is that they are, they enjoy life, good wine and wives or whatever, but they There's don't There's nothing work. wrong with that. Yes, with enjoying <laughs> life. Yes. Or that image. It's slightly racist, perhaps, uh, <laughs> structurally. <laughs> anyway, he says that France, France of all countries, the traditional ally for Germany, the whole reason for the project of European unity was for France and Germany to work together, that France should also joined that Zut Euro, as yeah. he calls it. What do you make of it? Ah, it was, of course, a very popular uh, proposal in Germany, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> that was ironic, I should say, uh, yeah, because German sorry. elites are totally committed to the Franco-German. Sorry, uh, I have to say when I'm ironic, because you're not used to Germans being ironic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Germans have no sense of humor. No, no. I lived in Germany for six years and I know that. <laughs> we drove you away, I know. Um, well, that was also ironic, what I said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Now, with the um, two euros, um, I'm reminded a bit about um, 
that, um, I don't know whether it was a joke or whether it was real, but there was a French foreign minister at the time of the Cold War who said uh, he liked Germany so much he was glad there were two of them. Right. <laughs> so um, if you really think that the Euro is such a great project, being a very ironic here, do you really think that you want two of them? <laughs> I think um, Henkel is going in the right direction. He makes some very good points in the book and I recommend it if you read German, have a look at Henkel's book. Um, it's, a, it's a good read. Uh, it's not uh, quite entertaining, I would say, because it's very serious. But I think um, he describes it very well, how the euro was introduced and what the expectations originally were, that it would be just some kind of Deutschmark plus. That's right. So, um, and initially it looked um, like that. Well, initially it looked like that because they uh, based the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. Frankfurt. They gave it independence um, and it was made to look like just an extension of the old Deutschmark, of the stability culture that was uh, so almost synonymous with the Deutschmark at the time. Now, so in, in that sense, the book is very good because it describes the whole process. And as you said, Henkel was part of that. He was at the time chairman of the Confederation of German Industries. And a very prominent position, actually. Extremely prominent, traveling around the country and uh, telling everybody that, oh, don't be afraid, it will be fine. Um, you don't have to lose anything here. You're just giving up your German mark, but you're getting something that's just as good, if not better. So um, to see Henkel turn around and now write a very, um, at times, polemical book against the euro, that's, uh, that's quite... Um, Courageous. Courageous and um, it's actually one of the few um, times that uh, a prominent uh, supporter of the euro has actually said I made a mistake, I, I got it completely wrong and he's very frank about that so for that alone I think it's worth reading. But I don't like the idea of a um, split eurozone of a Nord, Nord uh, Euro as he calls it and a Süd Euro um, because in the end you'll probably get the same problems once again just on a different scale and it will take some time but in the end you'll have these countries developing extremely differently and again, they will need different um, interest rates, different monetary policies. I mean, even in a country like Australia, we know that we often talk about a two-speed economy and that we've got some states that develop faster than other states. Now, ideally, I mean, that's, that's not an ideal monetary situation. But do you really think that's a good idea to extend it to maybe six, seven, eight countries and bind them together once again? when you still haven't solved the major questions about political integration, about um, common regulations, a, an economic government, I think you're probably just asking for a replication of the problems with the euro just for two different euros. But so are I don't you think suggesting then that uh, 17 currencies should be reintroduced? I mean, that even logistically that is probably not... I don't, I don't see it as a big problem. Now, I come, of course, from a country that has a, had its experiences with monetary reform. Um, if you go through German history, you can see that they created a national currency after German unification in 1871. And then um, they had, of course, a hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic, it replaced that old currency with a Rentenmark, then introduced the Reichsmark. The Reichsmark, of course, completely discredited in the Second World War, replaced by the uh, Deutschmark and with the Ostmark in East Germany. And then, of course, that being replaced with the Euro. So you've got quite a few currencies in a very short space of time. So currencies come and go. It's not unusual that currencies are established and then after a few years people realize it didn't quite work out that well. So I think the practical difficulties of reintroducing national currencies are overstated. It is possible. What's lacking is the political will because first of all it would take a mea culpa of the politi political class in Europe saying that actually, yes, we, we got it a wrong. We made a mistake. I mean, that's, that's what Hansel of Henkel does. He says, I was a firm believer in the Euro project. I still believe in European integration, but that monetary union just doesn't work. But in order for politicians to say that, I think that's a completely different thing because he was a businessman. He had never to be elected to any of his uh, offices. Um, for Angela Merkel or for Nicolas Sarkozy to say similar things, I think that would be extremely courageous politically and I don't see that happening anytime soon, but I would support it. Well, and it's even less likely that it would come uh, from anyone in, in Brussels, whether it is President Barroso, President of the European Commission, or or uh, uh, Rompuy, the President of the European well, they Council, because they, still believe they, see it as, uh, and they see it as the integral part of the project of European unity. Can you envisage European unity continuing within, without, without the common uh, currency? You know, the common market, the, the political integration that has occurred so far. I, I know that you are not a fan of many of these developments, but uh, can you envisage that the project itself could be maintained in whatever shape without the common currency? I'm a great believer in European cooperation. I think uh, Europe as an idea is great. I think trading within Europe is great. I think that the common market was the right idea at the time. The free movement of people, goods, capital, services, 
that was all fine. Um, my suit is British, my shirt is German, my tie is Italian. Oh, so you're European. I'm all European, <laughs> I think that's wonderful. But I think monetary union is not necessary then. Mm -hmm. Because um, just go back a few years before they introduced the Euro. Didn't they have a common market then? Of course they did. They were trading with each other. Of course you had to convert currencies now and then, but by and large it worked. And uh, really for the average European who probably goes on holiday once a year, not, not, not always to another European country, um, but exchanging money once a year, I think that's probably something that you can live with. It's a small sacrifice to make. Um, why do you need to have the added complication of monetary policy united for the whole of Europe? I think that's not necessary. Europe worked extremely well when it was the European Economic Community and when it was not the European Union. I think we really took that project too far. When we, were, we are destroying everything that we built up in the post-war period from within the monetary union. Just to give um, a tiny example, um, the Greeks and the Germans, I think they were relatively close before. There was no deeper no animosity. animosity. Yeah. Um, same could be said about the um, Germans and the Irish. Well, the Irish uh, have always been always the most been, zero farm, uh, also. Uh, the, Germ the Germans and the Irish were always extremely close. That goes uh, to some embarrassing heights even. Um, during remember the Second World War. During the Second World War when Irish cities were lit up in a way to guide the German bombers to England. And uh, when, the, when Hitler committed suicide, uh, the Irish the Prime Minister right. even uh, sent his condolences to the German ambassador. So, uh, traditionally, two countries that were quite close, um, not always for the right no. reasons. However, um, in the current crisis, you can see how monetary union is driving these old allies further apart. You now hear extremely um, angry voices from Dublin complaining about some bureaucrats from Germany being sent over to tell them what to do. You heard um, um, the uh, Greek uh, Vice Prim Prime Minister last year complaining about uh, the Germans interfering too much in national affairs and saying, well, actually, didn't the Germans rob our gold in the Second World War? Right. So suddenly all these old national uh, stereotypes and national prejudices reappear. Why do they reappear? Because it's tensions created by the Monetary Union project. Wouldn't it be nicer to go back to a project without a Monetary mm -hmm. Union where there is more European cooperation? I think it would work. Well, the irony is coming, going now back to Britain, that Britain might be more relaxed about Europe, partly thanks to the fact that they uh, stayed outside of the Eurozone. And I have two more short questions, perhaps, uh, from our students at Macquarie University about the UK and uh, the Euro. What would be the most negative effect for the UK if it adopted the Euro, though that's very speculative, considering that you pointed out that it's very unlikely to happen. And would the Conservative Party ever fully support EU integration? I think the second question might be more interesting. In fact, I was surprised to hear that even you can sound like a supporter of EU integration. So again, the question, would the Conservative Party ever fully support EU integration? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not necessarily a supporter of integration if that means really harmonization of everything, harmonized tax rates and so on. I'm a supporter of trade, basically. I'm a supporter of um, European exchange. That doesn't and is that what the Conservative Party would also? I think the Con Conservative Party would have no problems whatsoever establishing a common market and establishing the free movement of goods and services. That's all fine. That's within the Conservative DNA, I think, in Britain. It's a free trading party, basically. And a very, um, at least before David Cameron, it was very economically liberal as a party. Um, so I don't think the um, British Conservatives would have a problem with that. The problem for the British con Conservatives start where they have to transfer national decision making to Brussels. And just to give um, a tiny example where the British Conservatives are extremely angry about what's happening in the European Union is that case of um, voting rights for prisoners. I mean, it's a minor issue. I mean, how many prisoners do vote? And perhaps the problem for the Conservative Party is that they all vote Labour anyway. But um, the thing was actually, it was taken to a European court. Um, and the European court decided that uh, Britain had a treaty obligation to let prisoners vote because they couldn't just take it away from them. And so now the National Parliament in Westminster actually has to introduce voting rights for prisoners. And that's something, something that Conservatives have difficulty dealing with. Well, it undermines the notion of uh, parliamentary sovereignty. When it I was just going to say that. that it's, an old, it's an ancient British concept of sovereignty of Parliament, that Parliament can basically do whatever it wants. And then to be told by a faraway court what to do, that simply goes against uh, the British DNA and the DNA of the British Conservatives. So that's where I think the Conservatives have problems. We discussed that actually with a colleague from the Australian National University, Dr. Ben 
Wellings who published an article on, on that aspect of English national identity. So I urge you all to, to look up that interview. I just want to invite now our audience here to raise questions, issues, comments. Uh, so we have eight minutes. Yes, Stefan? Oh, thanks, Oliver. It's insightful as always. And uh, I'll ask the question which uh, I've kind of warned you about over lunch already. Um, given if I look at it's more a political question than an economic question. So if you look at Germany right now, um, you have the emergence of um, you had a very strong left party in the past. Now not anymore, but you have a very strong green party, for instance. But if you look around Germany, um, you have the emergence of a lot of what well, say right wing parties. You know, look at Netherlands, Scandinavia. Um, do you reckon this political these political tendencies have something to do with the monetary union? Uh, how is this um, kind of tied in together? And how do you given these very weird developments, how do you see the future of Europe as such? So a bit of a broader question. Okay, if we just go to the um, extremist parties, um, you're right, there is currently no big right-wing party in Germany. I mean, Extreme you, right. Extreme right. right-wing. Well, you probably could say that there is not even a right-wing party anymore in Germany because Angela Merkel has turned her Christian Democrats into a kind of uh, social Democrats light. And then you have the FDP that's uh, trying to abolish itself. You have um, the left party, which is um, all that's left of the former East German Communist Party. Um, and then there are the Greens on 24% in recent opinion polls. Um, so uh, no, there are no right wing parties in Germany anymore. There are no right extremist parties either. Um, but that's surely a good thing. That is a good thing. I mean, right wing extremism, I think, uh, by all accounts, has been properly discredited in Germany. They've really done their job in that regard. <laughs> um, so I think it is quite unlikely to see a resurgence of any kind of uh, xenophobic right wing extremism in Germany. And that's a good thing. Um, but um, to uh, answer your question about uh, the German political spectrum, you basically have uh, a number of different shades of social democracy in Germany now. Um, you also have different shades of green because all German parties, as, as you would, understand, would know now, are green. After Fukushima, they have all decided they want to get rid of nuclear power stations and want to shut them down immediately and then uh, see how they get by with the import of, of course, uh, nuclear power from uh, the France. Czech Republic and France. So. Um, the German political spectrum is weird uh, in that sense because uh, there is no great choice anymore. You can basically vote for any of the mainstream parties and you get by and large the same results and recipes. And in terms of the European Union, it's also weird because there was never a respectable party in Germany that was, say, as, con as Eurosceptic as the British Conservatives. Um, I remember that uh, the British Conservative um, MEP, Daniel Hennen, used to write a column for a German broadsheet, Die Welt. Um, and Daniel Hennen was, of course, a very exposed um, Eurosceptic in the European Parliament. And um, Hennen said once that he was very surprised how much uh, positive feedback he got on his column in Die Welt, because he, he was always told that the Germans were so Europhile and they really liked that whole But that's true of project. German elites rather than And that's the point. And, and Dan Hennen came to the conclusion that in the end, the British and the Germans were not that different. I think they are not that different anyway. Um, they were quite skeptical about Brussels, they were quite skeptical about driving this European project further. It's just that the political consensus was always very different. In Britain it was still a respectable position to be skeptical about European integration. In Germany um, it that was never the case. The Germans never had a Eurosceptical party because going back to the history of the uh, post-war period, uh, German nationalism was truly dead after 45. So in order to find some substitutes, some ersatz identität, uh, they had to go for this European project, and that's why you only have Europhile parties, whereas the people are probably a bit more skeptical. Other questions or comments? Yes? With the, um, the political and legal framework being so entrenched within the monetary union and the Eurozone, you were talking before perhaps about maybe folding back some of that, that framework and perhaps going back to the national currencies of each of the 17 members. What do you see as the roadblocks or the obstacles in actually getting back towards national currency, national monetary policy, etc.? And what do you think the likelihood of overcoming those policies within the framework of the within remaining within the framework of the EU? Okay, um, I, I think you're right. There is, of course, a substantial legal framework behind the whole European project, not just monetary union, but. 
again, I think in the end it comes down to political will because um, just look at the Euro experience so far. Um, the, the Euro was introduced and modelled um, on the German Deutsche Mark model. It was supposed to be um, a strong currency, a stable currency, a currency that was guarded by a central bank that was just as independent as the Bundesbank and there would never be a bailout, they had no bailout clause in the treaties. But of course when the political situation changes then these treaties are not really worth that much anymore because governments overrule them, there is a political will to do something. And then um, it may be in the treaties that you can't bail out another country, but I mean, we've seen it in Greece, we've seen it in Ireland, we've seen it in Portugal. Um, I think these treaties are perhaps a little bit of an obstacle, but they wouldn't stop it. Um, if the political mood completely turns around and if um, governments um, decide that it's in their own very national interest to do something outside monetary union, I think it will happen. And then you can have as many treaties in place as you want, but um, if there's enough pressure, um, they will overcome them. Just, just as an aside, sir, so how, how bad do you think the economic situation in the Eurozone will ha would have to be become before governments would see it as a politi politically viable to perhaps overcome those treaties and, and repeal some of the laws that, that bind them into the Euro? Related to this question, actually, if I may add, uh, how bad the public mood in Germany will have to be for a political force to emerge that would be more opposed to Europe? Hard to tell. Um, if you look at Germany, so far the Germans haven't actually paid that much. So far everything that happened happened in the form of guarantees. So they haven't been activated, they will be activated eventually, I think that's pretty certain, because uh, in the end it is clear that Greece won't be able to repay, so Germany guaranteed all that money, so someday Germany will have to pay. But so far it hasn't happened. What Germany had to pay so far were some marginally higher interest rates on their own debt because they guaranteed all of this extra debt. But it will or it could change once Germany actually starts paying out hard cash. And that will happen with a new European stability mechanism because in the next budget... That is the, as of 2013, yeah? That is of 2013 and um, two weeks ago Spiegel magazine in Germany reported that uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, the German treasurer, is now trying to find 22 billion euros for his next budget because he will actually pay this into this new stability mechanism in cash. And I mean, 22 million euros, even for yeah. a relatively big, rich country like Germany, is still a lot of money. And they are fighting over much smaller issues when it comes to budgets. Um, so whether that will be enough for the Germans then to say, well, actually, mm, maybe that's not quite what we wanted, we'll see. And for the other countries as well, I mean, it's not just a German issue. It's not that Germany just doesn't want to pay, pay, but the problem is that it won't even help the other countries because you may pay, you may give them loans, you may give them guarantees, but you're not solving their structural problems. So at some stage, I mean, you can do all these bailouts all you like for four or five years. And then the Greek will, will say, well, actually, did it help us? And they will say, no, we are more indebted than we were before and we still have unemployment, we have high youth unemployment and we're not going anywhere and we're not growing. So I, I think it will happen at some stage that one national government will come to the conclusion it won't work, either because they don't want to pay into some stability mechanisms or because they see that all the measures dictated um, from Brussels don't work. I'm afraid we have to finish and I'm not quite sure how to finish it. There are two ways I could finish it. One is I have the Irish ambassador visiting us in a week and I could ask you to ask him a question. Or another, would we, another way of finishing this would be to ask you how much longer do you think the Eurozone can survive? But perhaps you could do both, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> well, asking diplomats questions is always difficult because they're never really allowed to answer what they want. Um, and how much longer the Eurozone will survive? The problem with all of that is um, I'm just a poor economist. I think there is no economic necessity for a Eurozone. I think it doesn't work that well. I think it's pretty clear that it doesn't work that well. But whether it will survive long term is really a political question. There was never an economic necessity in the first place to start a Eurozone and it was introduced um, because there was political will. And now, of course, it would make sense to get rid of it as soon as possible because it doesn't work and the longer it drags on, the more costly it will become. But again, it could survive as long as there's political will. So it really depends on that crucial factor, political will. If there is enough pressure in European countries, as I said, either that they don't want to pay any longer or that they think the whole thing doesn't really do them any um, um, favors in terms of the economic competitiveness, then it might change relatively quickly. And maybe it just takes 
one country to make that first step and say, well, actually, we're pulling out for the others to fall like dominoes and say, well, actually, if they can do it, we can do it too. I want you to make one prediction because I'm going to invite you next year and I want to hold you to it. Will Spain need a bailout? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> by the end of this year. E, well, I said it's a car crash in slow motion, but um, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no happy end to this conversation. You can have a bottle of Rioja on there. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Oliver Harzich, Center for Independence. Thank Studies you. Sydney. Thank you.